Welcome, everybody, uh, to our webinar, uh, courtesy of the Call Collections Committee. Um, it is collections assessment and weeding. There's no one way to do it. Right now, we have Amanda Tiller Hackett, who is our first speaker from Memorial University. And Amanda is the collections librarian there, and we'll be talking about MUN's weeding for offsite storage program. So without further ado, take it away. OK, uh, thanks, Cynthia, and hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to give an overview of the ongoing offsite storage relocation process happening here at Memorial University of Newfoundland, as Cynthia said. Um, so I'll begin with some background information and just uh, review the situation and the reason why this process started to begin with. So since 2007, the library had its own storage and retrieval contract with uh, our facility, Iron Mountain. And then in September 26th of last year, it was announced that the library will be included in a university-wide contract, which is awarded to a new facility under construction. So DocuGuard was the name of that facility. So we're in the transition right now of moving things from Iron Mountain to DocuGuard. Um, because of the construction of this new facility, the library became tasked with coordinating a procedure for removing the collection from the old storage facility to the new one, and that's not a small fa uh, feat for sure. Um, since our off-site storage materials have been in need of weeding for some time, this relocation offered the perfect opportunity to tackle that project as well. So we would review our off-site collection and during the transition to the new facility, ensure that we only move the materials we wanted to keep in storage, discarding or relocating the rest um, of the library, uh, or uh, sorry, either discarding the rest or re uh, relocating those uh, to the library's main stacks. So that's where we are. Um, our initial plan went something like this. So firstly, we would create reports of storage holdings, which would allow us to make many decisions beforehand uh, as possible. Um, so for example, um, before the actual move, we would try to make as many decisions as we could. Secondly, we would filter all materials back to the Queen Elizabeth II Library for review before relocation to the new facility. Thirdly, uh, to do this, we would need to clear out space in our furniture storage area uh, of the library for temporary shelving for the materials as they were returned to the library in batches for review. And uh, lastly, we would airmark those as uh, either materials that would be sent to the new DocuGuard facility, uh, materials to be discarded or returned to the main stacks. The first step uh, was to wrap our heads around the, this, this relatively complex project that would involve and affect multiple units. For that reason, a committee was formed, which included representatives from these units. Um, their task was to work on a plan for a small-scale pilot to form the basis of the project workflow. Uh, this committee is overseeing the large-scale project, but for the purposes of this presentation, I want to focus on the collection side of things and talk more about the role of a second um, subcommittee that was formed. So this is a subcommittee of the collections division uh, tasked with um, handling the weeding component of the project. So the members of this, com uh, this committee include the head of collection strategies, one humanities librarian, that's myself, one social sciences librarian, and one science librarian, and of course in consultation with other librarians where needed. Our tasks are to, <laughs> the first task I list here is to um, look back at sins of the past, and this is our lighthearted way of referring to past offsite storage decisions that we now want to reconsider, and I'll get in, into this more, uh, into more detail later. Um, secondly, we are looking into national alternative, alternatives, such as the University of Toronto's uh, Downsview Shared Storage Facility, and we're considering what we would, what we should or could contribute to such an initiative. We're looking at, um, we're considering the coordination of the relocation of specific materials, so um, government documents. And in this situation, we're working with our librarian who collects for government documents. Um, fourthly, we're attempting some preliminary decisions before the boxes arrive at the Queen Elizabeth II Library for review. 
Okay. So our offsite storage materials um, include Queen Elizabeth II Library and Marine Institute Library ho holdings only. There are approximately 13,000 boxes of low-use materials in storage, and these include monographs, serials, government documents, microfilm, VHS, and other media, and of course, our ar archival materials. Um, we did, you know, with every project, uh, run into some initial concerns and problems. Um, firstly, it's difficult, we realized, to know the contents of each box in storage because many of our records, we learned, contained information at the box level only and not necessarily at the item level. So these things, these things will be difficult to read, of course, until we can actually open the boxes to see what's inside. Um, secondly, um, some things we think should be in storage. So for example, the original VHS tapes that we kept for copyright compliance once converted to DVD. Uh, could not be lo located in storage, but we still think they're there. They may just be, you know, this may just be one of our box level, item level problems. So hopefully we'll be able to locate those. Um, thirdly, we're unsure of, we were unsure of the environmental controls and conditions for archival materials at the new facility. So this had to be investigated more thoroughly just to see if uh, those materials would be safe in the new facility. Um, so as part of this review, we're also considering other storage possibilities, as mentioned previously. So for example, do we want to become a part of the national conversation about combined or shared storage? For example, the Downsview facility at the University of Toronto. Um, some of the considerations, or I guess the pros of this consideration, uh, would be, firstly, it seems that it costs more to retrieve items from our local offsite storage than through uh, document delivery. So for cost-effective reasons, we may actually want to consider these for some of our more unique collections or more used collections, potentially. Um, secondly, uh, there may be better environmental controls in uh, a shared storage facility than our own local one. And thirdly, of course, the opportunity to share unique collections on a national scale. In January of 2018, we decided, we started to consider what can be moved right away, just to get a start on this project and actually get it moving. Um, for the sake of time, we considered sending the materials to the new facility, and then from there, maybe pulling it back for a processing or review. Uh, we kind of settled on starting with, uh, with materials at the item level. So for example, we would send all boxes to DocuGuard, um, for which we knew the contents, and send the rest uh, to the library for review. So we'd open up those boxes to actually see what was inside and then read from there. It seems, on a positive note, uh, that our environmental concerns are potentially resolved. Uh, we determined, uh, this is not the best thing, but that the environmental controls at the new facility did not meet our standards for the preservation of archival materials. They were more sound at the old facility. So um, we decided that, uh, made an agreement that archival materials only would stay at the original facility, Iron Mountain, and the rest would be moved over to uh, the new facility. Okay, so now I'll return to our sins of the past that I highlighted uh, earlier in the slideshow um, and some of the lessons we learned from those. So. Um, basically, we learned that we had, uh, as previously mentioned, box level details, but not necessarily item level. So for weeding purposes, we needed more information on the contents of the boxes. So our, our goal going forward is to make those records more complete and to continue to include item level details. Um, secondly, <clears throat> we learned not to rely on circulation statistics alone when sending items to offsite storage. So, for example, in the past, we found out that many indexes were sent to offsite storage because of low use, but of course, indexes don't circulate, so circ stats aren't the best uh, indicator of uh, value when it comes to indexes. So some of those will have to be pulled back to the main stacks. Similarly, many newer editions um, of books were sent to storage because of lower use than their older editions, which makes sense. but. It means that we have many of the older editions in the main stacks while the newer ones are in storage. Um, and also um, volumes, uh, sets of uh, series were broken up 
um, because certain volumes that, that received lower use were sent to storage while, while higher use volumes remained in the stacks. So, so we have some cleaning up to do there to put things where they need to be. So just uh, to go over now the current status of our relocation. Um, so firstly, boxes for which we have uh, item information, this is largely monograph materials, are being sent um, directly to the new facility. Um, box level materials are coming to the Queen Elizabeth II Library so that we can document their contents and make weeding decisions. Uh, the transfer of item level materials commenced in mid-March and the estimated completion is mid-June, so it's underway. And the first batch of box level materials to be reviewed uh, is arriving at the Queen Elizabeth II Library the first week of June. This is next week, so we're going to receive uh, 1,183 boxes of print government document materials to start with and uh, review those before deciding what happens to them. And then fifthly, um, items requested since 2007 will be brought back to the main stacks. So then what remains will be uh, the un uh, unrequested materials only. Um, I should also add that the national shared storage options are still being discussed. So more news on that to come, I hope. Um, in the meantime, if items are requested, um, items that are sort of in limbo between one facility or the other, um, they can be requested through our interlibrary loan uh, system, document delivery. And uh, we've also created uh, new location codes so that we know where the items are, either in DocuGuard, Iron Mountain, or in transition. So we have a sense of where they are at any given time. And that's all I had. And there's my contact information. And I guess, are we taking questions now or at the end? Uh, we could take some questions now. Um, you still have some time left. Uh, so, does anybody have any questions for Amanda? If you do, you can unmute to ask, or you can type it in the chat box to the left. I see Maggie is typing something, uh, but it didn't actually come. Oh, she's still typing. <laughs> oh, there we go. So Val from Acadia, is there any redundancy plan for national shared storage options? Um, we're, we're in talk, so our cataloging department is talking with the catalogers at uh, Downsview and just looking at um, anything. I think what we're going to do, and we're still in talks, of course, but we're going to look at some of the, um, some of the items that are, are unique to us and uh, see then if they're uh, duplicated. So I guess the first step would be to look at anything that we'd like to donate or that we or, or contribute, and then see if there's uh, any, make sure there's no duplication at Downsview already. So I guess, is that the question? So yeah, that's, that's the plan pretty much, is to look at what we want to contribute and then look at the redundancy. Uh, we have a question from Merle Stees. Could you tell us what you did with your weeded items? Um, they're still making their way into the Queen Elizabeth II Library, so we haven't actually started the process of uh, looking through those boxes yet. But our plan is to um, either discard them <laughs> or, or send them back to the main stacks. So I guess individually as we look through those and get a sense of what's in the boxes, then we can make more decisions from there. Or of course, send them to Downsview. Option we want to pursue. Any other? Oh, Maggie's typing a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we Suzanne. can. Oh, Hi, Suzanne. Good. I'm on my phone. <laughs> I couldn't get my computer to work, so I had to log in through my phone. Um, Amanda, I came in a little tiny bit late, so I may have missed you saying this, but um, have you made a decision on how long you'll keep these item, items in storage, or is this? Uh, perpetual like are they are you intending to keep these items in storage forever and ever amen uh, the the items that we send to the new facility you mean yeah our new local uh, facility we're, we're, we're the plan is to keep them there perpetually until our next weeding project I guess whenever that is uh, okay it's taking right. a long 
for this current weeding process to come about. So uh, what we what we send to DocuGuard, we hope will be items that we we know for sure we want to keep in okay. storage until we. So, yeah. so I have a, a follow up question. Mm -hmm. uh, so my follow up question is. If you're moving site items off site to so into another storage facility, mm -hmm. are you building into your budget um, costs for that storage? So uh, I'm assuming that those costs will increase annually, just like everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just wondering if that's coming from your collections budget or somewhere else. Uh, my understanding is that the um, the new facility is actually more cost effective than the older one. So we're moving things from the older facility so it, we wouldn't get an increase in that regard it would be the money that we already used to pay for iron mountain um so we'd actually be saving money to bring things to the new facility and this is a shared uh, memorial university storage facility so it's um, for the whole province it's for it's for uh, memorial university so it's not okay. just the library storage facility it's the university storage facility right and yeah. is that it's being paid for though from a separate budget than your collections budget uh yes it's not the collections budget okay great thank you yeah no problem okay one last question and a follow-up from val what about redundancy for insurance of collections hmm that's a good question <laughs> i don't know could you expand on that maybe please like just yeah i don't know i don't know <laughs> I, don't, I don't know too well uh, what you could do is uh, think about so, it, and we'll t be yeah. taking questions at the end unless somebody is following up right now. I think I heard a voice. Heard a voice? Many, many libraries have had fires or floods in the past. Yeah. If yeah. there's only one set of collections, uh, that would be potential risk. Just right. wondering if anything's being planned for redundant collection. Oh yeah, I'm sure that's being planned at the at the upper level. So the first committee I, I spoke about that's looking at the actual movement and the administration and that sort of thing. Uh, from the collections perspective, I don't know where that stands, but I'm sure that's being considered. Okay, well thank you, Amanda. We're going to move on to our next presenter, who is. Uh, excuse me, Jennifer Richards from Acadia. Great, thank you. <clears throat> So I'm going to talk a little bit about just our experience at Acadia and a little bit about our history and a little bit about what we're doing now. Um, the kind of how we differentiated some of this was I was going to talk about a little bit more of a formal uh, process we're going through with regards to weeding. So I'll start. It's funny, Amanda, you mentioned um, about, uh, you know, some decisions in the past. So that's what I thought I'd start with and I called it, you know, Acadia's dark history. And again, with humor, um, things like we don't use the word weeding, you know, we kind of cover that in maintenance. And that comes, that's from our collection development policy. And that comes from sort of a history of issues in the past, which I'm sure other libraries aren't unfamiliar with. And what, what it started with, and it was prior, so I came to Acadia in 1997, um, prior to that, I couldn't actually, even the archivist couldn't remember when the last book sale was, but I think through the 70s and 80s, they had had uh, very successful book sales. They do, they do regular ongoing uh, weeding, and they would have a big book sale. Everything would be 25 cents, and it, it was great. They had uh, participation from the community and, and the university. But the last book sale, and that's when I couldn't pinpoint, the last book sale probably sometime in the late 80s, early 90s, what happened were, was that a number of faculty members bought the books from the book sale and donated them back to the library. And so that was a bit of a, an upset and kerfuffle. And so, as I state in the first point, we're not really, based on these sort of, um, you know, being a bit gun shy, we're not great weeders at Acadia. And even though our collection development policy says we do it sort of, it's an ongoing practice, we, we do kind of go through episodes where we kind of drop it for a while. And that's what happened after the, the big book sale that kind of ended all the book sales. Then in the late 90s, say early 2000, um, 
new university librarian, a Lorraine McQueen, came in in about 95 and uh, thought, okay, you know, we really haven't, this, this library hasn't done a whole lot of weeding, a whole lot of maintenance in a, in a while. Let's do a big project. And it became, again, infam infamously known as the Dotting Project. And the reason why it's called the Dotting Project is um, because we color-coded the books in the stacks with different colored dots. And we did do this based on um, usage. So we tagged books. I can't remember the color coding. It was red, yellow, and green. Um, but we tagged books that had never been taken out, been taken out less than a certain amount, and duplicates is what we did. And this project was prior to our collection development policy, our current collection development policy. Um, <clears throat> so what happened, and it really varied from discipline to discipline, and I suspect many of you out there know that um, oftentimes in areas like the sciences, I was a new science librarian here, I had very little issues. Um, faculty, when I told them, we did make the effort to communicate. Um, we, we, since I think Lorraine brought in, in 95, 96, the liaison model of librarianship. So at that time, in say 99 or so, we did have a liaison model and we, we all participated in this. Um, we sent out messages to faculty and asked them for their participation, told them what the coding was and asked them to come over. And the reply we got most often was, I'm too busy for this. Um, but many, many did, or many trusted the librarians to make the decisions. However, some, and not surprisingly, um, the history department was not so keen on this project. And so while we did get some, some sections of the, of the library weeded in this sort of massive project, uh, and it was the whole library that we did, which was probably maybe a little too ambitious, but the backlash was that some, there was a professor, or the, there was one for sure, who actually sent his summer students over just to take all the dots off the books. Um, so it kind, of, it kind of went down the tubes after that. Um, so that was really our last big uh, major weed. And again, from the experience and the negative, you know, the negative feedback, um, from faculty, we kind of dropped it again. In 2006, um, I don't know if it was done before that or not. It might have been. There might have. This might be a revised policy. But our current um, collection development policy is is from 2006. And I gave a little snippet. Um, so you know, we don't use the words weeding. Uh, we have we call it maintenance. And we under maintenance, we have something about withdrawal. And you can see the blurb on your screen, and the part I highlighted was a little bit of what makes things tricky for us, maybe, um, is that we do not weed, we do not withdraw books based on a lack of space, that that's not a legitimate reason for withdrawing material, nor is, and I just, I actually never really realized we had this in there, um, the number of times an item in the collection has or has not been signed out is not considered a legitimate measure. Um, it doesn't say if that's a sole measure, but um, I just, yeah, I was surprised by that. I knew clearly because we do talk a lot about the space issue and not weeding for space, but I was surprised to see the usage comment in there as well. Um, next, Cynthia. Great, thank you. Um, so what we're doing now, kind of a, a new beginning, as part of uh, Novanet, as one of the Novanet libraries, we uh, participated in the Green Glass, which is an OCLC product. Um, Heather's going to talk in detail a bit more about what it does and, and kind of what we did. Um, at Acadia, we chose to get data on everything we could what was out of scope in the project from the Novanet office, not from us, but from the Novanet office, was serials and special collections. And of course, obviously, special collections make sense to be excluded. Um, I'd also note that Green Glass, 
the data, we have, I think, access to the data for about two years, but that the data is really a snapshot in time. So it's taken from your catalog at one point in time, and then that data can be manipulated and, and used for a while, but it is that one period of time. And um, the data in there is customizable. Uh, Novanet, there was the collections group, I believe, um, worked together to kind of talk about what other comparator libraries we wanted, who we wanted to compare our collections with, um, and of course within there, there's usage data as well. So this is our sort of um, new opportunity to have more data and another tool to use to address, uh, I guess, sort of a fairly major weeding project. And. Um, there was, I think, an expectation, or we received a request from the Novanet office to, um, to tell them how or why we were using green glass. And so that, from that is where our five-year collection assessment project has come out of. So that's the formal process that we're going through now, and the tool we're using is, is green glass. Next slide, please. Sure. Great. And this is a little bit hard to see, but uh, and Heather will probably talk more about it, but it's just a sample. Um, I couldn't get the full, of course it goes in an Excel spreadsheet all the way across, but these are sort of two blocks of the type of data that's in there. So you can sort by your location code. So, you know, we can look at if we're just looking at our stacks or if we're looking at our audiovisual materials. Um, Again, you can compartmentalize the data and, and generate different reports with it. It's got, uh, so the location code, the call number, the name, you know, the typical things, the publisher, the author, those sorts of things. You can see two possible duplicates. And those sorts of things, those, that data relates to all of Novanet as opposed to, so this was done, even though Acadia's collections and each of the library's collections can be brought out and generate it separately. Um, when you're looking at duplicates, I'm pretty sure, unless Heather, I'm wrong, it's, it's a comparison. The duplicates are within the whole Novanet collection. Uh, you can also see at the bottom information about the usage, whether it's been charged out or not, and then the, the possible libraries or the possible holdings elsewhere. So worldwide holdings, you know, global holdings, and then the Novanet groups decided which comparator libraries we wanted to look at. You, know, you see one there was, you know, who we use for interlibrary loan because we may be borrowing books from there. The one drawback about Green Glass, it being a uh, snapshot in time, is that as we're all doing this, there might be, you know, 10 copies in Novanet, and if all 10 libraries <coughs> that, uh, that book, because it's just a snapshot in time data and we're not collaborating, we're not talking about which or sharing at, at this point, which books we are removing, um, that you do run the risk of re everybody removing the same book. Now that's probably a little unlikely, but. So that's just a little bit of what the green glass data looks like. Uh, next slide, please. Ten. Great. And. So like I said, we decided we would go with a little bit of a formal organized um, project again this time. Um, we called it the five-year plan. We wrote up a little blurb as to what we were looking at, uh, how we were going to do it, and it's hard to see there, but um, this is our plan on our intranet. And it's a document which breaks down, what I did was I took, um, the data and I downloaded it by call number ranges and reasonable numbers of spreadsheets. So somewhere between usually 5,000, 10,000 and corresponded that with the liaison librarian um, who has that role. So the way we've done it here, it's kind of a bit of a sign up sheet with a date and time. So you would put in when you're going to do, you know, if Anthony, Anthony's the theology librarian, so he'll, he'll cover the bees, when he's going to review the bees, um, and I guess his name by it, and then a place where he can say he's completed that, uh, that section. 
the way each librarian will do the analysis is really up to them. So the data is there for them to use. Um, we have committed that all of us are going to do it and look at our sections and, and note in the form when it's done. But whether you just use the data um, and do it all from your office or you bring your computer down or an iPad and go into the stacks and look at both the books, and, and the data together, that's solely up to the discretion of, of the liaison librarian for their, their sections. Um, next slide, please. Done. And again, as we always, I think we thought we were communicating well when we did the dotting project, um, but we all know that communication with faculty when we're doing these sorts of projects is really important. You, um, what you really don't want, and I know um, Newfoundland went through that even with cancellations, it's similar kind of issues. Um, you don't want rumors to get started. You don't want a lack of information to get filled up with um, you know, strange stories and rumors. So we, we try to communicate with faculty. In this instance, we've, uh, we presented the plan to the Senate Library Committee, and we got their feedback and kind of buy-in. We passed the, uh, the project through Senate as well on behalf or you know, the Senate Library Committee put it through Senate um, with no, no comments, no, no upset. Um, and then what we're doing, what we, we did send out direct communication. So again, between the liaison librarian and whoever their contact is in their department, either the whole department, the departmental secretary, a library rep, that sort of thing. Um, and as we go through the next five years and we start uh, updating, going through assessing, we will be sending out reminders and sending out invitations to faculty to participate. What we'll do as we take things off the shelves, we will put them um, in, a, in a space that faculty can come and have a look at. Other librarians can have input on because we all, you know, we do work on the reference desk and we know sometimes what's being used in other subject areas. Um, so people will have an opportunity to say no. That's, that's a really valuable book. I, uh, I think we need to keep that. I refer to it a lot or I send my students to it, that sort of thing. So we will be um, sending those reminders out. So we're hoping that this will be uh, a success. Thank you, Thanks. Jen. Um, so we have time for at least one question. There will be time at the end for questions, but we want to make sure we get everybody's uh, presentation in before we focus on questions. But we have time for one question. You would be our next speaker. Anne LePage from Mount Allison University uh, is going to speak next. And hopefully Heather will be able to uh, to get things going a little later on. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, <laughs> I know it's just Cynthia response, but um, so um, I just want to talk about a little bit about what we're doing at Collections at Mount A. Um, before I start, just a little bit about what Mount Allison's collection situation is. Um, we have a very small staff here. Um, we also have a very small budget. Um, we're looking at about a million dollars a year. Um, and about that's separated between 50-50 between operational and endowment funds. And about 70% of that is taken up by serials and another, the other 30% by monographs. Um, so we really don't have any budget for any fancy, fan-dangled analytical tools like Green Glass or Summon or any of that stuff, Serial Solutions or anything. Um, but um, and we've also had the conversations about the possibilities of off-site storage, which kind of is a blue sky dream for us, I think. Um, we really don't have a location around Sackville to create that um, storage facility, um, and uh, we certainly don't have the funding as yet. Um, and most of our evaluation is done by the subject librarians um, with the help of technical services and access services. Um, so it becomes a full team project. Um, so some of our major projects, I did a presentation at APLA in Moncton 
um, a couple of years ago about um, our science periodicals. Um, it was kind of inspired by an ad hoc committee we had to talk about um, the relationship between the sciences faculties and the library. And there was a resounding, um, overwhelming opinion that more of the science collections needed to be online and more of the science funding needed to be dedicated towards periodicals. Um, as a result of that, our sciences librarian at the time, um, who was Brian McNall, and he's now retired, lucky, um, <laughs> he, um, he actually um, contacted Elsevier um, because most of our sciences um, journals uh, being used at the time are through Science Direct. So we talked with them about um, access denials, whether we could um, look at Elsevier as a possible backfile purchase. And in fact, that was, um, that was um, a very helpful um, project. So what it meant um, was that we did an entire backfile purchase over three years of our Science Direct journals. And that ended up meaning that we ended up being able to weed uh, a substantial amount of our print serials, um, print uh, science serials from our collection. So now um, I would say about 95% of our serials, science serials are online. Um, another project we had was our with our reference collection. We had an, a huge reference collection. It it took up our entire main floor. Um, there was a resounding opinion that we needed more space for um, open communication and group work for the students. The students wanted more space to uh, to be here um, and. Uh, they also were talking about adding a new lab for the U4 uh, projects, and they were going to do that in the library. And one of the likely places was going to be on the main level. So that meant that we had to do a massive uh, weeding of our reference collection. Um, so we ended up getting rid of about, I'd say, a good 60% of our um, reference collection on the main floor. Quite a bit of it ended up being um, uh, put into our basement uh, floor as a basement reference circulating collection, um, commonly known around here as BARF uh, because the code is BRF. So uh, anytime we talk about reference collections not being used, we talk about whether we need to BARF it. Um, uh, it's a lovely term, um, <laughs> but uh, it works. Um, the, uh, we also have done several overlap studies over the past few years while I've been here. One of the biggest ones we did was uh, through um, Academic Search Complete and Wiley. Uh, we kept being told by EMSCO that Academic Search Complete would suit our needs to rid ourselves of the ever expensive Wiley collections. Um, unfortunately, like I say, we don't have very good analytical tools. We don't have overlap analysis tools. Um, we don't have um, uh, the funding for those types of things. So it ended up being a title by title comparison with staff. Um, where they looked at each title um, and found out where it was overlapping. What it turns out to be for us is that most of our usage uh, for Wiley is the, um, the stuff that would otherwise be embargoed in Academic Search Complete. Um, so this is our biggest reason for not ridding ourselves of uh, Wiley. Um, because we need the um, we need the uh, subscriptions to the what would otherwise otherwise be embargoes on those titles. Um, otherwise, we would lose access to those, and um, again, our sciences faculty would definitely not be very happy about that. Um, also, our JSTOR weed. I think everybody does this every every few years. We we look at the rolling uh, moving wall on JSTOR uh, periodicals, and then we we 
um, get rid of uh, the JSTOR um, print, anything that comes in print that we are overlapping with JSTOR. Um, we also did an analysis last year after we um, after we acquired uh, ProQuest Central. We got the ProQuest Central Religion database as part of that. Um, so we did take a look at whether we could um, uh, look at um, if we needed to uh, reduce our ATLA um, ATLA with serials uh, with full text. Um, uh, coverage um, and just use ProQuest Religion and in fact actually they have very different collections and very different coverage so that definitely wasn't going to be an option for us so um, our process like I said um, or as I mentioned in some of the other projects uh, we run uh, compile spreadsheets doing reports from Cersei um, which require a lot of cleanup um, and we can get the cave art files um, either through our world share management system with OCLC, um, which is what we use for our, um, our A to Z journal title um, retrieval. Or um, we, and we use, we, we will download counter statistics from all of the admin uh, sites from our vendors. Um, I usually do those um, when we need to renew to produce usage statistics, so we have those on file. Um, then we do title by title evaluations and we sort by Library of Congress call number and then any possible suggestions, we send those on to the subject librarians for an ultimate decision and consent. Um, the technical services assistants and the students, they will look at the KBART and title lists. Uh, they will do the title by title comparisons. They uh, look at coverage, moving, moving walls, they consider embargoes. And for the JSTOR weeding again, they are sorted by Library of Congress call number and sent to the librarians for confirmation. Although most of those are on a blanket approval. Other projects we have going on are um, uh, Recon, um, uh, uh, Acadia mentioned a DOT project, um, that was our DOT project. Um, it's called the Green DOT Project um, uh, and uh, it's, it's been ongoing ever since we were automated back in 1982, I think it was, when we first got DRA. Um, it, it's, uh, we have an awful lot of um, older material uh, in our stacks and uh, we're actually still finding <laughs> some of that um, that has never been barcoded or entered into our system. Most of it is done, I would say a good 97-98% of it is done now. Um, there is still quite a bit left in our um, Canadian history and Indigenous studies areas um, where we're trying to finish up. Um, but yeah, um, we're looking at uh, 30, 30 some, almost 40 years later and, and we're still working on that one. Um, we also have a, a, a new project that we've started. We've, we've hired a full-time, an extra full-time student um, to, to handle this project of itemizing all our serials and volumes. Um, we're doing it mostly because we had to do a major insurance project a, a few years ago. Um, it was extremely difficult. We had to go through and count our volumes um, by hand in the stacks <laughs> because our reports just weren't handling the um, the information that the insurance people wanted. Um, so we had to go through um, one by one. And so we realized that having item records um, would certainly help not only for the insurance um, per, uh, prospect, but also for um, being able to run usage reports because we don't have any clear usage stats on our print, um, print serials at the moment. And um, also, um, we're looking at a new ILS project, um, and so we're, um, or new ILS implementation, so we're 
um, trying to prepare for some of that so that we actually don't try it and we don't lose content. Um, I've been told that that may not be um, preventable, um, but we, we certainly want to put in some measures to at least try. Um, the other projects that we've been doing, um, we've got some ongoing uh, weeding projects. Um, we've had uh, controversies in the past, much like what Jen expressed from Acadia. Um, the faculty really do love their print, especially in the humanities. Uh, so they can get very upset uh, when they hear of us uh, possibly turfing or weeding out uh, certain areas of our collections. But unfortunately, we are running out of space and we have to do something. Um, whether it's we look at uh, something in E or um, we look at and finding new material or something else. Um, so these decisions happen. Um, the, the weeding happens directly from the subject librarians. Um, they evaluate the material. They make the decisions. We used to have a faculty review um, to allow the faculty to feel like they had a part in the evaluation process. However, we found that the most of the faculty just weren't reviewing. They weren't taking up that, um, that uh, for lack of a better word, privilege uh, that, we, that we allowed them to come in, take part in this. They just weren't participating. Um, and um, so what happened after the faculty review is that we'd give them a certain amount of time to come and review. If they said, no, it needs to be kept, then we kept it, and otherwise it would go to our book sale. And we did have a book sale that we would earn money from. Um, the way things work in Mount A is that if we earn money, it goes somewhere into the black hole of financial services. So we didn't really know where it was coming from. And we also found that by actually selling the books, it was uh, more of a deterrent um, to our community to um, get the books. So we actually now, we still have the book sale. We got rid of the faculty review. We have the book sale, um, but book sale is in quotation marks. Um, because it's very loosely um, still called that all the books are free. So anybody who sees anything down in the book sale area, they just can take it and go. And it's theirs. Um, if the books aren't, get, aren't picked up after a certain amount of time, uh, we send our books to Better World Books. And um, there they are either recycled um, or they are sold. And then if we... They take, we get a bit of a commission from them. So once we, I think once we make like $50 or something, then they send us a check. Um, I think that's happened twice in the past, I don't know, four years that we've been working with them. So it, it, it doesn't happen often. Um, but uh, it, at least we know that the books are going to a better place. Um, we also did a, I've done a, I'm the subject librarian for Spanish literature and I was getting an overwhelming, um, we love ebooks, um, uh, voice from the Spanish literature faculty. So, um, I created, um, a trial DDA. Um, Mount Allison does not currently use, uh, DDAs or PDAs, uh, or any type of program like that for ebooks. Um, so this was my kind of experiment to see if a DDA would actually work at Mount A. Um, so I thought Spanish literature is a small enough area, um, it's quite small, um, to um, try it and see, see what happens. So that just happened this last year. Um, my result, I put meh. Um, <laughs> We, we've had about 300 books loaded into the system, and only one is so far has been purchased. Um, and that happened over the last, I'd say, six months um, after notifying the Spanish faculty of those uh, e-books being there. So, um, so yeah, it's, it hasn't been terribly successful. It, it's um, Unfortunately, it's not 
allowing me to keep making the case of uh, getting more ebooks as opposed to our print uh, to substitute or supplement our print uh, collections. Um, but uh, that's um, that's what it is. So maybe I'll try it. I'm thinking of trying it in anthropology um, now and seeing if it will work there. Something a bit bigger, a bit more interdisciplinary. Uh, and see if we get any better results. And that's about it for collections at Mount Allison. Thanks, Anne. Um, we don't have time for questions right now because we want to make sure we get our uh, remaining three speakers in, uh, but there will be time hopefully for questions at the end. Uh, so uh, Heather tells me that she is online, so Heather will be up next to present. Hi, folks. I think you can hear me now. Yes, definitely. Excellent. So now I'm loading the charts. It should just take, take a second. Mm -hmm. So step through these fairly quickly. Jen touched on some of the things um, dealing with green glass. So I'm going to talk about green glass from an um, you know, airplane view. So green glass was developed by an outfit called Sustainable Collection Services, who were then acquired by OCLC. Um, it's a subscription service. It provides a web application. Um, the application allows you to explore and visualize your collections in the context of a larger collections environment. It also allows you to very quickly model deselection and print management scenarios. The key advantage of, of, of Green Glass is that it brings together a lot of the data you need to do analysis and make decisions about the collections, whether it's to support weeding exercises or whether it's to support moving things in and out of storage, um, whether it's on-site or off-site. So Green Glass, uh, as Jen mentioned, is a snapshot in time, um, and the OCLC folks bring together three types of data. Holdings data from your ILS, and that's typically bibliographic data. Circulation data, um, how many times something has circled. Um, how recently it is circulated, and sometimes it can be difficult or time-consuming to bring those two kinds of data together. Much depends on your ILS. And OCLC brings those things together and then normalizes it against data about the print universe. So that would be data about holdings in your region, um, in the Novanet uh, context, holdings within our consortia. Um, data about holdings within Canada um, and within the, the world of OCLC reporting data, reporting libraries. So for the Novanet project, um, the data includes monographs, scores, um, but not ebooks and not journals and not special collections. So a fair amount of material is included in the data. I'm going to skip over this slide and just give you, show you a very murky screenshot of what the interface looks like. The interface has a very short learning curve, a couple of quick queries, and you can get a sense of how to use the tool. There are facets down the left-hand margin of the window, and those facets allow you to build multiple kinds of queries and support um, multiple approaches to um, how you want to analyze your collection. So the queries can be built very quickly. They can be resaved and reused. Uh, they can also be modified over time. And as Jen's presentation showed you, the data can be exported into Excel. And in many cases, using the data in the Excel format is quicker and easier to work with. Hop to the next slide here. So here are a couple of very com commonly used facets one for location. So you, when you load the data into Green Glass or when OCLC does it for you, it will load it in groups, which you can define, which allows you to compare collections and sub-collections. So here on the left, you could see that we could technically compare the AV collection at, at AST, which here is represented as ASAV, to the AV collection at Acadia, which is AUAV. So you can compare collections across a consortia or within a multi-branch library system. So that's possible to do with a, without a lot of fiddling. Um, the other thing Green Glass um, supports is querying by LC class and LC subclass. So 
If, for example, you wanted to look at um, reference collections in a region or between libraries, you could drill down and build a query that said, show me all the encyclopedias shown at um, SMU and AST, and you could have conversations about rationalizing collections based on that sort of comparison that otherwise might take you a fair amount of time to do. Hop to the next one. These are examples of a couple more facets that are particularly useful. We've used these mostly to support um, weeding exercises in the various uh, libraries. Publication date I found to be more useful than acquisition date. Um, it, you can set that publication date to be you know before or after certain dates. Um, circulation date. Also helpful, especially if you're trying to isolate material that may need to be weeded or circulation, um, high circulation items that you might want to supplement. Maybe something is circulating a lot and you might not be aware of it and you may want to add more copies. And the third facet on the right here shows you where you can compare your collection to one or more uh, comparator libraries. So. If you were, for example, trying to decide whether you should weed something and were uncertain about whether or not you were weeding the last copy in Canada, you can run a query to, um, to find that out pretty quickly. Hi, Heather. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, just to cut in quickly, uh, uh, one of our folks on the phone is having a hard time hearing. I, I can hear you well, but uh, they're having a hard time hearing. Yeah. So if you can speak just a little bit louder, that'd be great. Yep. Um, so here's a, a quick slide showing you two kinds of questions that can be answered in about five or ten minutes using green glass. These are one is a, a silly question, one's not quite so silly. Um, answering these questions, if you had to go into the stacks or count, mat count manually, would be very time-consuming. But in two minutes or so, I can could figure out that if we did need to move books from Dal to Acadia. We would only need two books to hold all of our materials on re Apple's research. And similarly, two or three minutes to figure out how many books we could potentially move from our military history section into storage if we had the space. It's about 900 items. If we had to make those decisions without green glass, it would take us, um, as you can all know, considerably more time and effort. Hop to the next slide here. Uh, Jen touched on a couple of the limitations with green glass. Its primary limitation is that it is a snap, provides a snapshot in time, so that it doesn't reflect additions and removal from the collection. The other limitation um, that shows up when you're trying to do fairly specific kinds of weeding is that you can't, in the interface itself, query below the subclass. That means if you need to look in a particular call number range, you need to work in Excel. Um, as well, it, you need to do some fussing if you are trying to identify items within a, separate your library's items from the entire consortium's items. That can take a little fussing. The other thing that Green Glass, um, it's not actually a limitation, I suppose, but it, what it will surface are sins of the past. So it will, it will surface cataloging oddities. Um, it will surface items that appear to be duplicates but are not actually duplicates. So when you use the tool, you need to be mindful of that possibility. I think I just have one slide left here. So I've whipped through some of this very quickly. Um, SCS has a fair number of video tutorials on YouTube, which can give you a sense of how the tool actually works. Um, the, the videos are pretty good quality, and they're short. And I'm also happy to set up uh, time to do live demos for folks if you're um, interested in seeing how the tool works live. Yeah. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you, Heather. Uh, any questions for Heather? Okay, so hearing none at the moment, um, we'll move on to our next speaker. Uh, so if you want to stop sharing and uh, 
you can start sharing. Uh, Melissa Belvati from University of Prince Edward Island is going to talk to us about uh, alternatives to green glass for weeding experiences. Okay, well, while I'm waiting for the first uh, slide to come up, I'll just go over a couple of things orally that aren't on the slides. Um, thinking about what the people who've spoken before me have said, um, I think we're kind of similar to Mount Allison in size uh, from the library perspective. Likewise, we don't have, we've explored, but don't have any reasonable offsite storage options in our, um, in our area in Charlottetown. Um, we may be in a little bit worse shape than they are in terms of budget ratio. Um, I, I actually happen to have just looked at this a couple of days ago. About 90% of our collections budget is spent on non monographs. That's basically everything but books and ebooks. So databases, journal packages, all the rest of it. So we're, we're down to about between 100 to $150,000 a year spending on monographs. And that includes subscription monograph packages like the EBSCO and ProQuest big academic packages. Um, we haven't seen a budget increase in collections in at least five years, and I don't have the records going further back than that, except for when they give us money specifically earmarked to support new degree programs, um, which I don't count because it doesn't help us pay for the price increases in all the existing materials. Um, a few years ago, some of you have heard this before, a few years ago we had um, a problem with uh, our basement was our our compact storage for older materials. It was basically our, our overflow for the, the main collection. Oh, let me back up and say, so our building, our, our main collection is all on one floor, which is the upstairs. Where, so, you know, you're, our, you walk in, there's all the usual stuff, reference and computers and the service desk and everything. And then the upstairs is where all the books and periodicals are, except for what was the really old stuff that didn't fit upstairs, which went down to the basement. And a couple of years ago, we had a mold outbreak and our facilities department basically said, we cannot ensure the integrity of the humidity and other HVAC controls in that room. You have to get all of the, the print materials out of that room, uh, completely out of the basement. That was our overflow because we were already full upstairs. So I was, I was a little bit amused and a little bit crying when uh, Jennifer was talking about how space, lack of space is not a legitimate reason for discarding books, because for us, it's like the number one reason, because we have no choice. We have no offsite options. We cannot fit the books from downstairs upstairs. In fact, we discovered the mold when I was in the middle of a project to move more books from upstairs to downstairs, um, because we were running out of space upstairs. So for us, that, that's sort of just the opposite with it, um, as far as rationale there. Um, what we've been doing is we've been having to, to discard, you know, massive. We're on the on the scale of sixty to seventy thousand books um, out of a collection that is now down to about. I just ran the, the numbers about three. Give you a sense of scale. We have about three hundred and ten thousand barcoded items, which represent about two hundred and seventy thousand unique titles in print, not counting the ebooks. We're now well above that, so we're much more than fifty percent of our monograph collection is now in ebook format. But that gives you so the rest of this is really about um, when I talk about collections assessment and weeding, I'm talking about print materials. We haven't really started to deal with issues to do with the concept of weeding <laughs> ebooks. Um, I'm sure we'll deal with it eventually. So um, also the one last thing I want to mention is um, in contrast to I, I think what some of the other speakers and some of your institutions may have, our, our position our, 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 on, on the issue of, of faculty involvement is that um, collection assessment, weeding, um, collections management is the, perv the professional purview of the librarians. I'm very proud that we have a very strong collective bargaining agreement. And from our perspective, while we certainly um, are interested in faculty input, and we will sometimes consult them if we're not sure on a given title or series or something, whether it would be useful to the curriculum, we feel very strongly that it is part of our academic freedom as, as librarians under our, our faculty agreement to make decisions um, about, about things like weeding. And we would no more go into the faculty offices and tell them what should be in their syllabus than they should be telling us what should be on our shelves. And that, that's, I, that's probably going to shock a few people to hear that, but I thought I might as well get it out there. Okay. So let me. 
get onto. So, um, so when it comes to, uh, and I'm just going to be honest, we're talking about weeding because I just described to you how dire our situation. It's about weeding. Um, with our print collections, we are in our catalog system, our ILS is evergreen, and what that got, does for us, it allows us to to do completely raw SQL database level queries on everything in the ILS, the mark, all the individual fields, the variable and fixed in the mark record, the circulation data, all of the item location data. You, you can, if you know SQL, you can create any kind of query you want and, and, and retrieve data, spreadsheets and spreadsheets of data. I do this a lot. Um, we do have the eBooks in the catalog, but it's really hard to try to combine things because ISBNs never match with the print materials and everything. So I'm, I'm not gonna be really talking about eBooks here. Um, our Evergreen system dates back to June of 2008, and that's as far back as we have been for circulation data. Prior to that, we have to rely on, on the old-fashioned due date stickers at the backs of the books for deciding when the last time was that a book was checked out. And just a little note there, we have no money for green glass, so we have to do everything in-house. And as, as I said, by far the biggest goal is shelf space, is, is that we're faced with an untenable situation. We have to do something. Um, we have also done some age of collection analysis. Um, honestly, we haven't done much with that data yet, except just to deform, inform the librarians so that they that we have a sense of the picture of that. And when I do that, I do make a point of also combining that with the ebook data as well. So people don't feel like, oh my God, our history books are so horribly out of date. It's like, look at the histogram for the ebooks. They're doing just fine. Um, and, and this one last one that's come up in this last year is, um, is, is a, a smaller goal, but relevant to, to weeding is if we have, and I call it embarrassingly out of date books. Um, and this was one that, uh, our, our new education librarian happened to notice when we were browsing upstairs. There's a whole bunch of books that have the phrase retarded child in the title, and we probably want to get rid of those. Okay, so we've done different rounds of weeding trying to deal with this problem um, for different purposes. Um, we obviously went for what I call the low-hanging fruit. Duplicate copies, especially if the if this second, cop second or more copies have very little recent use, those are the first to go. Easy, easy peasy. Um, then we started looking at older editions. Um, and again, where the older editions themselves have little recent use. Um, we're totally comfortable with throwing away, and I'll, I'll show you sample data, you know, the second and third editions when the book is up to the eighth edition and the second and third haven't checked out in, since 2008. Um, and then of course, as I've described, more painful but necessary, sometimes we have to throw away older books that have no recent use, even if there is no, equivalent, no more recent edition, no ebook version or anything. It's just we, we're out of space. So here's some examples of the kind of data. Um, and these are just little pieces of what are actually much wider spreadsheets with many more columns. But um, so, for instance, for the project on dealing with multiple editions, here's just a little segment of, of the kind of data. I, I ran an SQL query that specifically looked for um, I've forgotten the mark tag now, 264, whatever it is, um, that has the edition statement and pulled out all the ones that had some kind of ED in them and then sorted it by call number so that that tends to put all of the additions together. Um, and and uh, so what we did with that one is I put this whole spreadsheet together, the whole thing sorted by LC, which approximately corresponds to the different librarians, the subject librarians, subject responsibilities and had them go through it and and basically highlight like you know literally in the spreadsheet you know which are the ones that they'd be comfortable throwing away based on on this um or throw away assuming that the um because there was another column in the spreadsheet that actually had the circulation use on them as well um then the larger report um circulation activity and i know for some of you with much larger collections Excel would literally choke on this stuff. I, I, when I even tried to put our entire 300,000 plus collection into a single spreadsheet sometime, and I'm trying to work in Google Sheets and it just can't cope with it. So I end up breaking it up into like three spreadsheets, you know, by call number A through G, H through M, and N through Z or something like that. Um, but here's an example of, uh, again, generated using an SQL query. Um, total number of checkouts in, in the system, call number, location, pub date. And so you can see this, a report like this um, serves multiple purposes. It helps us find the older low use ones. It doubles as a shelf list um, 
basically allowing the librarians who want to look for those really offensive book titles to not have to physically go to the shelf and hold their head sideways while they walk through the stacks. They can just use this to, to find those. Um, and then it, this also, because it's got the pub date in it, this, this same spreadsheet can also be used for doing age of collection histograms and things like that, grouped by LC call numbers, if, if that's relevant to you. Okay, so the, the issue everybody struggles with, and I'll bet a lot of you do too, um, when is library discretion, and I, by that I mean title by title decision making, when is that really necessary as compared to the cost of a librarian's time to do that? There's only six of us, and everybody thinks it's absolutely ideal if, if we never, ever throw away a book except for the subject librarian actually looking at that particular book and making the decision one book at a time. We, we really wish we lived in that world and we don't. So we decided that obviously the offensive out of date content has to be a manual discretionary decision. Um, we also felt that, um, that the multiple edition problem was needed to be manual and uh, because there, there are going to be some titles that are so important that we'd want to keep the multiple additions around. Um, but when it comes to the very large scale project that, that we're in the middle of, that's, that we need to have heuristics. And, and typically we have, and I'm thinking back to Jennifer saying that the uh, number of times a book is checked out is not a legitimate factor. For us, it's, you know, aside from the issue of space being the driver, that the lack of circulation activity is the number one driver of heuristic base as opposed to manual base weeding decisions. So here's an example, I call this the painful weeding. This is the, we don't have a, a necessarily another copy of this in any way, but we've got to do it. Um, this is just, a, we have this whole spreadsheet and I just took out the piece of it that's me, MB is me. Um, some of the subject areas that are of my, my decision-making purview. And we agreed on how, on how we would set this up. So, um, and then it's up to each librarian for each individual class and they're free to break it into subclass, uh, subclass ranges. One, one, the, Librarians broke up, you know, like QA to QA1 through QA50 is this, and QA51 to QA500 is something else, that kind of thing. So we, they do have that freedom. And you can see what we're doing here. So for a given class range or, or, or subgrouping, um, if the publication date is before a certain date, and, and the librarian can choose to say or, <laughs> um, and that book has also not checked out since a certain date, then it's going to be subject to handing these criteria off to a student assistant to go start pulling books off the shelf. And again, we'll we'll be specific in our training since that um, that checked out date involves looking at the old fashioned date due stickers. I think we're we're intending that we're going to assume when there's bad data, like there's no date due sticker, or things are smudged, or the or people were handwriting in dates. I've seen this date dues that didn't include the year; they only included the month and date. Then we default to assuming that's that we keep that. But when we have clear, obvious data, trust, reliable data, we're going to apply the heuristic, and we're going to just go ahead and get rid of these books. So getting rid of these books now, um, because of the, the massive project we've been doing in the basement for a lot of the much older, the, the, when I talk about the basement and the older books, we're talking almost entirely about pre-1970 publication dates. Um, we partnered with Better World Books to, to give them many of those books. Um, the ones that, you know, for whatever other reasons we, you know, we weren't keeping. Um, and uh, we do generally run Someone mentioned book sales. We run book sales about every two years or so um, in partnership with one of the student clubs, uh, student uh, academic clubs like the, the Business Society or the Sociology Association or whatever, um, where basically we've been collecting the books in, in one big storage room. They get to do all the work of sorting it out and, and, plan, and doing almost all the work of, of running the book sale in exchange for what they get 50 percent of the money and we get 50 percent of the money. So that works out well. So anyway, that's it for UPI. Are there any questions? Uh, we're actually going to hold off on questions, uh, Melissa, just oh. because we have one last speaker, me, um, and so we oh, want to try to get uh, get our get my presentation in. But uh, hopefully, I will go through fast, and we will have lots of time for other presentations. Okay, off you go. Okay. Uh, nothing fancy, but um, I'm a little bit of a different tack on this on a weeding project. Uh, 
I used to work at Concordia University where um, we had a major renovation of the downtown library and the weeding project was a part of that renovation because um, there was a significant requirement for reduction in, in space, uh, in collection space in that renovation plan. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick little bit of an overview first of uh, the situation at Concordia. Uh, so it's in Montreal. There's two libraries. There's a downtown library, which is larger, and then there's a smaller library out in the west end of the um, of the city. Uh, the renovation was specifically on the downtown campus library. Uh, and just to make things so much easier, uh, the collection services staff, so my whole unit, had moved out to the suburban campus library just before the renovation project was to begin. Um, that actually was part of that renovation plan. So uh, most of the staff that might be involved in this project were at the other campus. Um, we had no storage facility uh, of any sort. We had already done a journal uh, assessment project, so uh, we weren't really focused on that. And we were using the III Millennium ILS system, which has a very robust uh, reports module uh, that was very helpful in this project because we too didn't could not afford uh, a green glass uh, option, and we decided we actually didn't really even need green glass because we were able to do a lot of that uh, analysis within our own systems. Uh, we had a great um, I had a great uh, term co uh, contract librarian who uh, worked tirelessly on most of this. Uh, the unfortunate part is because this started as a renovation project before I arrived, uh, it was very much uh, the, the, the terminology being used with uh, those up outside of the library was weeding for space, uh, which is never a good way to start a weeding project uh, in terms of uh, communications and, uh, and basically the PR and, and the optics of the project. So the first thing that I did when I got here was to change our terminology around it how, and how we framed this project. It was no longer a weeding project. This was a collections reconfiguration, which was very accurate in that we were going to be moving all of our collections around. Um, so, uh, but it was just a, it was a better terminology to use for this. And we also made sure one of the biggest communications that we started uh, in terms of uh, blanketing as much as possible our stakeholders was the idea that this was this what we were doing in this project was responsible stewardship of the collection so uh, there was a reason for this we were doing it to um, make sure that the collection we were providing to our users was valuable to and useful to them um, and not necessarily for just for where we weren't weeding for space um, we also had, I, I'm not going to read through these because you can read just as well as I can, um, but there was the ones I just want to highlight is consultation was key uh, for transparency and inclusiveness in terms of getting the faculty and the students on board with the project. Um, we made sure that data, it, that our decisions were uh, data driven and supported by data. Um, as well as input from uh, and, uh, the stakeholders. And the uh, other selling point was th that we were trying to make the user experience better. We were going to clean up the collection, clean up the catalog, so that they can e they have uh, easier to access and it's um, also they'll be able to find what they're looking for much, in a, much faster. Um, one of the things that uh, both Melissa and I think uh, Anne had mentioned was Better World Books. We did go, uh, we did market very heavily because Concordia is very eco-conscious. Uh, the idea of reuse and recycling, um, reuse being our book sales, and recycling being uh, books going to Better World Books and also a local um, organization for the French language materials. Um, as Melissa has already mentioned, and I think Anne as well, that also is a, uh, a place where you can realize money to put back into the project, especially if you have a large-scale project. Uh, which we did have. Uh, just to give you a heads up, the, the, the space that we needed to free up was 45,000 linear feet in our collections, which is about 67,000 volumes. Um, so it was a large scale, but it was not something that could not be done. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on planning, and so I'm just going to move on to the next slide. Um, I can't emphasize enough the importance of planning well before you start such a project. Um, the, 
it will save you tons of time down the road and tons of heartache and, and problems if you put a significant portion of your time into the planning of this. This was a multi-year project. It was uh, the actual physical movement, construction, whatever, was uh, to take about three years. Uh, we actually started a year before that in terms of planning. Um, we developed a project charter, um, developed timelines, uh, gave lots of thought to resource needs, training, um, and, and gathering data and also our communications and I'm going to go into these in a little bit more depth. Okay, just keeping an eye on the time. Oops, got to run through this. Uh, so uh, project charter is the big picture. It tells you uh, everybody exactly what you plan to do in this in this project. Um, one of the things we emphasized was the impact it would have on the user experience uh, and this was a great place to do that. Uh, Scope was was to give us that framing for what exactly do we plan to focus on in this project so that we didn't get scope creep where we started to think, oh, we might want to do this. This might be nice to do. No, you don't want to do that in a big project like this. You don't have time and it will really mess up your, your schedules. Um, there are things that you could put in a parking lot and say, okay, after this project, we will go back and look at these things. Um, the uh, risk assessment is very important. Uh, because you need to identify as much as possible ahead of time what might be the risks like faculty backlash, things of that nature, and and come up with the ideas in advance for how you might address those risks that might come up. Like how would you address uh, any faculty backlash? Um, we also, uh, in, in a project of this scope, it is majorly important to identify all the, par all the people who will play a part in this um, and their responsibilities in this process. Uh, so that everybody knows who is doing what. Um, no problem, Mark. Uh, this will be posted online. Uh, and then last, uh, stakeholders, communication and consultation is key, and that's um, something I'm going to talk about a little further. Um, so it's very important to use uh, some sort of a methodology in how you do your planning. Uh, we did formal charters. We did formal timeline development, and you'll see uh, we've done this at each little sub-project or each part of the project has its own little section with its specific tasks within that uh, the, that section. Uh, deliverables, uh, completion dates, responsibilities. It's very important that everybody knows who's responsible for delivering what um, in the project and in generally what the time frame is in terms of sequence of things occurring. Uh, that's especially important because we're also uh, needing to coincide or match the schedule for construction. Um, because uh, of some of the things that we had to do in terms of where we would store things in certain periods um, had to be had to be taken into account the what whether that space would be under construction or not at the time. Um, and then we also gave uh, is it highly important to have that uh, responsibility factor in there. Okay, so I'm just going to fly along here. Uh, if anybody wants um, copies of these documents, I can always send them to you. Um, they, you can reuse, recycle, whatever. I'm uh, very open to s passing them along. Um, these are. This is where we come to the sub-projects. We had the major project, but uh, and we were focusing on every the type of item we had in our collection, not just one type like monographs or journals. Um, so. Each project had its own manager within that project, so that sub-project we called them. Um, and they developed a charter and a timeline for their specific projects as well. So um, we actually have separate timelines within that 501 section for theses. There will be a timeline for that particular project as well with all of these things included. Um, and that's what those, uh, why they're in green, because they're links to those particular specific timelines. Um, so at this level, we're just describing generally what that subproject is going to do, but there's going to be a much bigger um, and more detailed uh, project plan later on uh, in, in another part. Um, so, uh, I'm just flying through here. Uh, this is just a quick list of this is uh, most people will want to know. Yeah, we had some. Uh, there was it, it was a lot of work and and coordination and planning was totally key. And having somebody leading the project who was the outward facing voice and also the person who was also coordinating all the pieces was very important. But also having those managers coordinating each of the different sections was 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 um, fantastic. Um, and it, it was crucial to the project. Um, just to give you an idea, this is the preliminary what we do with monographs. I just wanted to give you an, an idea of our monograph sub-project. Um, we were actually focused on 1950 to 2000. Uh, 
uh, in terms of what books we were focusing on because we wanted things to have time to circulate, which is why we stopped at 2000. And then we started only at 1950 for this project because uh, that copyright date cutoff, we wanted to make sure we didn't throw out anything that was uh, unique or, uh, or of particular importance. And we plan to go back and focus on that collection later on with a gen the same general idea. Um, so uh, I'm just going to move on. And, I, and if anybody wants details on any of these sub-projects or the project overall, I can give you lots of details. Um, I'm almost to the end here. Uh, training. Training is key, uh, particularly at the outset of the project. All of your managers are going to have to manage a project, and a relatively large project. A lot of those uh, people are coming from your own staff currently. Uh, actually, all of our, ours came from the existing staff, the existing librarians uh, did uh, for those particular uh, collections, potentially, uh, manage these projects. They're going to need lots of support. Many of them may never have managed a project, especially a project of this magnitude. So we did a lot of training at the outset. We did uh, play a, a training on the, the project management platform, which was um, SharePoint. We did uh, we did a training on project management skills, things like how do you use charters, how do you develop charters, timelines, um, how do you organize people, how do you do resource calculations of what sort of resources you would need, um, documentation. Uh, we did training on all of the documentation we used, uh, including how to use the timelines, how to develop them, how to develop a communication plan around each sub project. Uh, we also developed tons of templates that everybody could use so that we were all using similar documents and we weren't all doing our own thing. Uh, we developed guidelines for versioning and how we would track uh, different versions and, and changes that were made to documents. And uh, one of the key things we did was also develop naming guidelines for documents so that everybody's documents were named in a similar fashion uh, that indicated the, what the content was, uh, when it was done, and who did it, and what version of the document we were that was. Um, and then, uh, then you have to think of your staff. Um, they need, they're going to need lots of, of uh, training on what's happening and how to do things, procedures. So we developed a lot of written procedures uh, and actually had a lot of staff training uh, in this process. Almost finished. Resource needs. This is key, especially as the leader of the project, um, to uh, look at staffing. Um, at Concordia, we had a semi-unique situation in that Concordia does not allow the use of student uh, staff. All staff are in the same category and are paid the, at the same rate. Um, those are all permanent type staff and, and term staff are all paid the same rate. Uh, so no, so no uh, cheap, cheap cost with students. So we focused a lot on using the internal staff that we had, uh, but we had to identify who, when, where. Keep in mind our collection staff were mostly all out at the other campus, so uh, there was a lot of commuting back and forth. Um, we uh, we did a lot of liaising with uh, the, the construction company, with our own internal logistics folks, um, in terms of movement of materials and things of that nature. Um, labor relations can't can't stress that enough that you need to make contact with those um, unions to discuss the, what might be involved relating to the staff that are going to be involved in this project. Um, you've got to think about things like um, uh, uh, basically the movement of those staff and how much time they spend um, in, in commute. Uh, they're going to be working at a location other than their own base, home base. What, uh, where are you going to provide space for breaks, things like that. Health and safety restrictions. Uh, many staff in their job descriptions have limitations on how much they can lift, how much uh, they work and do physical work. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. Labor relations is key. Make sure you make that contact at the beginning. Um, space, we had to find the workspace, and I know others have mentioned it too, the swing space for putting, uh, for working and, and packaging up books, doing uh, things like that. Um, storage for, for in a construction, in, when you're doing construction, you got to think about, you may have other places in your building to move things temporarily, well, what, if they need to start working on construction at a particular spot, but you may not have that space. So you have to think of where you might be able to find that space either on campus or outside of that, and then you have to think about access issues to those collections while they are in there, uh, and the timing of the movement in conjunction with uh, the construction of what things are going to move when and to where.
uh, stuff. Um, there's lots of stuff to think about. Equipment, uh, sc uh, buying uh, barcode scanners, getting good equipment for your staff to use uh, that makes it as easy and as efficient as possible for them to do the job. Uh, we invested in uh, handheld scanners, uh, some uh, some iPads. Uh, we appropriated from the ones we circulated to students uh, for the project. Uh, health and safety issues, do you need to get goggles, do you need to get masks, uh, those types of things. Um, and then the last, uh, not quite last, but um, your database decisions is hugely important in the PR and the optics and we're talking with your stakeholders that you have data behind all, all this, the message basically. Um, you need to know your library mission and vision. Are you a storehouse for everything that's ever been written or are you there to meet the needs of, of the current projects, uh, excuse me, the per current programs in your institution? Um, you need to be well aware of that and you need to stick to that mission and vision. Um, mining your ILS, uh, like I said, I, III has a robust reporting mechanism, so it uh, was um, uh, it was a, a treasure trove for us. Uh, but coming up with the right queries took a, a long took us a, a, a time to get the right iteration uh, to get the stuff we needed out of the system. But once we did uh, and had it down and we had it documented how we got that, um, it was great. Uh, we were able to do a lot of decision making based on that data from our LS. And then we also looked at duplication elsewhere in terms of the digital digit uh, collections that we had, uh, the archives on campus when it came to our theses, other libraries in the city uh, where we could easily get um, material sent from. Um, so there's a lot of things to look at in terms of the data. Uh, not just bibliographic data. And lastly, uh, communication. There's no such thing as too much communication uh, when it comes to a project of this type uh, where there is the perception that things are leaving the collection, where people may have a connection to it um, or a personal feeling of connection to items. So uh, develop your public presence for the project before you go live with talking about the project. You need to have a place where all of those, everything that you need to communicate is ready and waiting to, to be communicated. Um, and then we had to, you have to make sure your upper administration, deans, all those are, are on board with what's going on. They know what's happening in the library so that they aren't blindsided when they get questions from those in their departments. Uh, talk to your students, uh, town hall meetings, visit department meetings, as many ways as you can as possible to get the message out and to explain what's happening and to be able to point them back to that public presence that you will maintain and keep updated. Um, because if, it, if your data is two months out of date, um, you will start losing your stakeholders, the support of your stakeholders. Um, so that's in, in a nutshell. Sorry I uh, went so quickly, but I'm hoping um, you got a lot out of that. Uh, like I said, I've got tons of documents and tons of templates, guidelines, all that stuff. If anybody is interested, I can send those out to folks. Um, and I, if you want to talk more specifically about specific sub-projects like monograph weeding and stuff like that, I can sp share a lot of information on exactly how we went about doing that uh, and the various iterations. As you saw, we did four iterations from low-hanging fruit to the most contentious things. And uh, you'll be amazed at how much you can realize in terms of um, uh, weeding, I guess, at the low-hanging fruit levels. Uh, so that's all I had. Uh, if anybody has uh, any quick questions for myself or any of the other speakers, please speak now or type a message in. And uh, and just a note that this will this re this is being recorded, so it will be put up on the website uh, very soon, uh, as will all the slide decks from all the speakers. And it will be uh, uh, closed captioned. It just may take a little while to do so. It takes about a day or two to closed caption an hour-long webinar. I would love a future discussion about what to do with the remainders. Uh, after book sales and Better World Books, we'll be left with thousands of discards, physically, ethically, or environmentally sound ways to dispose of the materials. Um, so uh, that was a question that was pointed to all presenters that question and how did the departmental meetings with D Trump go well um, with meeting with some of those folks it's uh, sometimes I felt like I was meeting with Donald Trump uh, but um, but you have to have those communications even if you th if they may be the gruffest person on campus those communications have to happen and you just have to handle it and and uh, keep with the communications <laughs> uh, so 
<laughs> I tried to make it a little bit humorous. <laughs> uh, the big cheese ones went really well, too. Um, anyways, uh, so that's all we have right now. Um, so uh, thank you all for attending. And uh, thank you all to the presenters who presented today. It's, uh, everybody had a lot to, uh, to contribute to the session. And we're very, and I'm uh, very happy to see how much information we were able to share today. And mostly stay within schedule, I apologize. So we will be signing off, and thanks to all of you who attended. Uh, it was great to have your participation in this. And I'm sure everybody, all of the presenters will be open to having follow-up uh, with each and every one of you if you are interested.